you know, there are real world consequences for writing these articles. It could be even consequences for me or for the people I write about or even Bitcoin in general. I mean, here I am, you know, writing this thing about somebody about National Science Foundation. And I'm like, wait, what if this is going to hurt funding for you know, cryptocurrency? Hello, welcome to episode 29 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. I first became acquainted with Bitcoin journalist Brian Cohen back in mid-2014 as we were both active on the revamped Let's Talk Bitcoin platform. I didn't know a thing about Brian, but I saw he was doing some fairly serious Bitcoin journalism. Moments before my Skype interview with Brian, my computer crashed. I rushed to get it back online and failed to realize my audio input device had reverted from my primary microphone to the device's built-in microphone. The result is that my audio is not even close to the quality I try to deliver. So I apologize, and I need to research why my USB bus keeps locking down on me every few days. If anyone is an expert on such things, please let me know. Now here's my interview with Bitcoin journalist Brian Cohen. Man, Brian, so this is a Friday night. I haven't done a Friday night interview. I probably should have got a beer or something. I haven't done a Friday night interview. I haven't done an interview. So, <laughs> yeah. You write a lot of articles about Bitcoin. And I mean, just to get started, can you rattle off some of the media outlets that you're proud of that you've written for? Sure. Uh, Let's Talk Bitcoin, of course, was my breakout article with Bitcoin. Um, Coin Telegraph, and of course, Bitcoin Magazine. And I have a history of writing articles about eBay and PayPal. Uh, my first article was about PayPal. It was for a venue called Auction Bytes, now known as uh, E-Commerce Bytes. And it was about multiple currencies at the time that you're able to accept currencies other than your native currencies, perhaps the euro. And you can hold on to that and then sell it later on if you want to for, you know, a profit. You mean you could do this just through PayPal? PayPal via eBay. PayPal was like ingenious. I, I, you know, that's probably where I got my start with eBay really was back in like 1999 or so. I thought it was totally amazing. When did PayPal first launch? 98, but the way it is now, you know, probably like 99 or 2000. What got you into writing articles? My interest is e-commerce. You know, I, I thought it was kind of really cool. eBay um, is, I guess, what, what kicked it off. Um, I thought it was really cool that I can buy and sell things to people all around the world. Just, you know, I was there sitting in my apartment in Queens and shipping things to people in Europe, in Australia, what have you. I was like, wow, this is amazing. I could have an international business and I'm just here sitting in my apartment in Queens. I was an eBay trading assistant. I would sell like art and antiques for people. That was cool. That was fun. I met some interesting people. So that got you interested, but what actually got you writing? Writing is one way of me learning about whatever it is that I'm I'm trying to understand. So I, I don't necessarily go into the articles knowing everything that I just wrote about. It's a learning experience, you know? It's what is it, heuristic? I like to try and research it, write it, feel it out. In fact, you know, my early articles about Bitcoin, I had never even used Bitcoin. I didn't even download the Bitcoin client. Um, that, that article, Users Bitcoin Seized by DEA for Let's Talk Bitcoin, that was the first blog post on Let's Talk Bitcoin. You know, the breakout article. I really didn't even know there was a Bitcoin protocol, that it was decentralized. I hadn't even downloaded the Bitcoin client at that point. So you definitely own no Bitcoin at this time. Was that I didn't even own any Bitcoin at this time. It was through tips from that. And I said, wow, you can get tips over the internet? Just like that, it was a totally amazing experience. You're saying this was the very first post on the Let's Talk Bitcoin site or when they kind of... Yes, as, as a blog post. I mean, he had um, podcasts prior to this. And, you know, I reached out to Adam. Actually, I reached out to another venue before this. And I said, hey, this is, you know, what Bitcoins look like when they're seized. And this, I kind of knew, like, you know, that theoretically Bitcoins weren't supposed to be able to be seizable. I didn't really know why at the time. And I said, well, you know, this is something that's very interesting because I knew there was a lot of friction between Bitcoin and government. And I was very interested in that. And I tried to track that. And I said, wait, this is not supposed to be possible. And nobody has written anything about this. Let me just kind of put some feelers out there and see what people think about this. I had written an article that I tried to shop around and it was about BitMit, which was like the eBay of Bitcoin. 
And I was kind of, you know, disappointed that nobody really seemed interested. It, it, like, it wasn't really for e-commerce bites because Bitcoin at the time was a little bit too edgy. I, I was like, I can't believe nobody's interested in this Bitman article, which was later published magazine only format through Bitcoin Magazine, but that was only after that I had my breakthrough through LTB. I just had this assumption that, you know, you'd probably been somehow working with Adam for a long time or known Adam. Not that you just met Adam, I guess, just to get this first article out there. And That's right. But I, I had listened to his podcast and, and I was like, you know, this was like food for my brain. I was like, this is great. You know, so I had listened to a few episodes of LTB before reaching out to Adam, obviously for this piece. Interesting. Okay. So that was your first one. Um, oh, well, I mean, I did have something for e-commerce bites uh, prior to this in, in, in March. And that was um, how PayPal almost liberated Cyprus. And um, it was basically, I found somebody on Twitter mentioned that they had a bank account uh, over at Cyprus and they also had their PayPal account hooked up to it. And they were able to move money, I think, from their bank account into their PayPal account. And I said, well, you know, this is not supposed to happen. And I also had read um, Jackson's book, uh, The PayPal Wars, and, and I kind of knew that PayPal, the original idea behind this was very similar to Bitcoin, that this was a way to liberate people out of their native currency during a currency crisis. Talk a bit more about that book, because it's, I, I don't know anything about it. Eric Jackson was one of the founders of PayPal. And... Uh, you know what? Let me just pick up that article, how PayPal almost liberated Cyprus and just see if I have a quote there or something. Let's see. From uh, Eric M. Jackson's book, The PayPal Wars, published in 2004, he described how PayPal may have played out in this type of situation. In the future, when we make our services available outside of the U.S. and as internet penetration continues to expand to all economic tiers of people, PayPal will give citizens worldwide more direct control of their currencies than they ever had before. It will be nearly impossible for corrupt governments to steal wealth from their people through their old means because if they try, the people will switch the dollars or pounds or yen, in effect dumping the worthless local currency for something more secure. It was this potential that made the Confinities, or PayPal's vision, PayPal was originally called Cofinity, and I think they were called uh, X.com, or they merged with X.com. Anyway, their vision of world domination, which might have been more appropriately called world liberation, all the more credible. And it goes on and on, but this is one of the girly guys who are there with PayPal, and that's his book. That's interesting. I think I'd heard some talk that PayPal was kind of more like Bitcoin at the beginning. If you go to the Federal Reserve website, you'll see that they had lots of meetings with, with PayPal way back when, and... I'm sure they kind of uh, kind of cooled things down a little bit there. You basically started by writing that, that Let's Talk Bitcoin article. And how did you break the story about uh, the government seizure? I knew that, that Bitcoin and governments, um, there seemed to be a lot of friction between the two. And um, I, I thought to myself that I really should focus on how the two intersect. And I tried to track government documents. So I kind of like to look for like deep web kind of things whether it's looking in like chronicling America, Library of Congress, or even the patent database. Some of these things aren't necessarily readily accessible by Google. But this piece happened to be this, this DEA Caesar notice. It was accessible by Google, but you have to do these complex search strings sometimes to find what you're looking for. And actually, more recently, I've been getting captures by Google telling me that like I'm a robot, like, hey, Brian, you can't possibly be a person behind that keyboard. Nobody be crazy enough to type those things into our search bar. But no, oh, it was me. You know, I had to type in, yeah, I am really a person. That first article about the seizure, that was the Silk Road seizure, right? Well, we assume it was a Silk Road seizure. Everybody assumes it was a Silk Road seizure, and, and, and it probably was. And I was actually kind of nervous at the time because, you know, it wasn't just me that wrote this article that, you know, Adam, of course, like, like I mentioned that, you know, this really was my first deep dive into Bitcoin and I needed a lot of help to be able to write this article. And there were a lot of people, you know, it was Justice Ravener, we had um, George Edinger, Dan over at Coinality. And, um, you know, other folks, and they were able to download Tor and then go on the Silk Road website and see, well, you know, this person sold these drugs and, you know, we say, well, should we add this to the article? And I was kind of really nervous about that. I'm like, I think we have enough here. What we have here is gold. Let's not go this next step. 
So how did you know all these people? I reached out to Adam. Adam helped write the article, and we, you know, we farmed this thing out to everybody. I'm terrible at covering like mining. I'm not very good at that, and for the most part, I do news breaking stuff. Like I don't have to cite other people as the source of this because I'm one finding it. In any case, uh, it was the National Science Foundation, the um, scientist who was using a supercomputer to mine for Bitcoins. And so it was uh, what Ruben Alexander, the editor over there at Bitcoin Magazine, I said, you know what, maybe I need to bring you on board here because it's a little out of my depth sometimes with, with mining. But that said, you know, you know it, was, it was a fun article to write. <laughs> this guy is using a supercomputer to mine for Bitcoin. So this guy was trying to make some Bitcoins, not do a research project. That's right. That's right. And, you know, sometimes some of these articles it makes me a bit anxious. I'm writing about the government and these are things that I like, I, I like to call them, what, open secrets, because it's like if I don't find this needle on a haystack, there's a good chance that somebody else is not going to report on this. And that, you know, there are, you know, real world consequences for writing these articles. It could be even consequences for me or for the people I write about or even Bitcoin in general. I mean, here I am, you know, writing this thing about somebody about National uh, Science Foundation. And I'm like, wait, what if this is going to hurt funding for a cryptocurrency? No, that's not the case. You see lots of cryptocurrency projects that have been funded recently. In the same regards, it's like I see this stuff out there and it's like I feel a responsibility to report on it. But, you know, again, some of these government articles, it's like, sh should I be writing about this? I'm like, well, I found this. I mean, I could pass it on to somebody else. Is there anything you've just decided, now? Nah, I don't, this seems too scary? <laughs> I guess in that regards, I've actually been asked not to write articles. And it's not because these people did anything wrong. It's like that I find out stuff about the company and it seems like I know too much. It's like when I write these patent articles, like with Coinbase, I knew if I reached out to Coinbase, they're going to have this anxiety about talking about their IP. All right. And they might take a few days to get back to me. And in a few days also, even if they do get back to me, then somebody else might break the story or they might not bother getting back to me. So you broke the story that Coinbase had filed some Bitcoin patents. Yeah. But I mean, and like other people have pointed out to me as well, hey, this is just, you know, information that's in the public. But I just want to say that, I mean, your article stirred up, you know, a lot of discussion about that. There's this, this, this balance, like... Companies don't like talking about their IP. I have reached out to people before and asked them about their IP, and they don't get back to me. What is the suey I'm going to let you guys in on a little something I don't talk about much. For the first 25 episodes of the Bitcoin game, I believe I was tipped the equivalent of about $12. Then I received a single tip of about $12, and that was really exciting to me. A doubling of my total tips. But then I had John Barrett on and discovered that listeners had tipped both John and I each over $100. I sincerely thank everyone who has ever tipped, even the smallest amount. But when you start tipping at that bigger level, you really do give an additional incentive for us content producers to keep going. Want to know another way to keep content producers from throwing in the towel? Advertise. If you have a business, your advertising spend is a tax write-off. It benefits your business with a marketing message, and it directly supports a content creator. If you have a business, buying an advertisement is a much more logical way to support a content creator than sending a tip, because you reap a benefit too. So while tips are great, if you've got a Bitcoin business, advertise get something out of it. Actually, it's funny that uh, stories that came out this week that I wrote, or I guess this past week, it was the PayPal cryptocurrency, PayPal reputation token, and their blacklist. And I knew that eBay had filed for the patent. You know, it's a patent application. You haven't granted the patent yet. But I looked at it and I saw what they were talking about. And it was PayPal this and PayPal that. And I looked at who the inventor was. And he worked for PayPal, not for eBay. I said, oh, you know something? This has probably been reassigned to PayPal. And I'll just kind of talk about that. But And that's how I kind of wrote the article. I'm like, okay, it probably belongs to PayPal for these reasons. But then, you know, it's seldom do I actually have to even dig deeper 
And I probably should have that there's this database at the patent office called PAIR, um, and that it, you could see correspondence. And so I was reminded of that after I saw people do follow-up stories, um, and they had, for the most part, everybody said, eBay, you know, filed for this patent application and look what eBay is doing. But no, that's not the case. If you go and look at PAIR, um, it shows that it's, it was reassigned this past July to PayPal from eBay. I, I knew it wasn't eBay patent, but I just, you know, it skipped my mind. And if, if somebody's going to do a rehash of the article, they might as well add a little extra flavor of their own. And it's too bad that somebody didn't catch on. I think we've talked about this before that, you know, about the, the hat tip and what, what a hat tip is. You know, you're walking down the street, you, you tip your hat. It's just a way of acknowledging the person down the street that, hey, how you doing? And, um, you know, this is something that I've tried to work on with other Bitcoin media outlets that, hey, you know, I've broken a story here and I see that you covered it also. I, you know, I don't think that your venue would have covered the story had I not published my article, you know, would you be kind enough to give me some attribution for this? You know, you really can't, you can't copyright facts or even fake facts, right? So it's not, it's not like plagiarism. If I go and I break one of these stories, like from the patent database, it's not like somebody has to go and credit me on this. But in some regards, you know, I, I've taken the time out of my life. Oh my God, you know how much time I've taken out of my life doing research on Bitcoin and, you know, to, to find some of these things, sometimes it takes a lot of work. And then somebody goes and just snatches it out from you and publishes an article about it. It's like, that really sucks. I was wanting to ask you about that. I get a lot of news just by scrolling through my zero block feed. And I'll see an article that seems to be an original article. And then for hours and days afterwards, I'll see other sites basically regurgitate the original article. And it just seems so annoying. You get to be the first-hand person who suffers from that. So that must happen almost every article, right? It does happen a lot of articles. And you know what I'm really hoping happens one of these days that you that these articles are kind of embedded in the Bitcoin blockchain so that they have like a timestamp. And it'd be super cool too. I mean, I'm sure somebody's going to do this too, that you have like a snapshot of the Bitcoin price at that time that the article was published, kind of say, you know, here's a snapshot of the minute this article was published, this is what the Bitcoin price was. And this is exactly when it was published. I mean, that's nice and all, but I mean, even now with the tools of Google and stuff, I mean, I think it's, people aren't trying to backdate their articles to look, make it look before yours, are they? Oh, no, no, no. Not, not. So it's clear. It's clear who's first and who's copying. Right. If you look, if you make an effort to, to search it out. I, I don't think it's that clear, especially a lot of people are going through Google News and that what will flow to the top, it'll say what's most cited. And what's most cited, it wasn't necessarily what the first article was. For sure. Um, I just, as someone who looks at zero block several times a day and, you know, I feel like no headlines at least escape my eye that I just get so annoyed seeing, you know, clearly someone broke an article a day or two or a couple hours ago and then clearly you're just pretending like this is your article, <laughs> you know, rewritten, but it's obviously you read this and then you wrote this article and it's, it's kind of lame. Eh, maybe it's not ethical. Maybe, it's, maybe we'll just say it's lame. Well, I, I do think there, people do, notice. Do they have to? I mm -hmm. notice it's, there's some sites I just noticed, hey, these are the sites that almost always do that. And these are the sites that don't seem to do that as much. And I mean, I guess it's not black and white, but. It's not plagiarism. It's, it's not, you know, like a copyright problem. It's just. I guess the ethics of, of, of the media outfit. Today's magic word is reporter. R-E-P-O-R-T-E-R. -E -E Use the magic word to claim your share of this week's LTB coin listener reward on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. You have one week from this episode's release date to claim the magic word. It felt to me like suddenly you disappeared from the Let's Talk Bitcoin scene and the forums and everything. Um, yeah, I did take a break. I was in the process of moving. So I moved from Brooklyn to Brooklyn. I just had to regroup and need it, needed a break. It was also at, the, at that time, it was Mike over at CoinFire um, had reached out and he's like, you know, I'm, I'm doing this article on uh, Goa miners. Do you think you want to get involved? I was getting super nervous about that one. Did you get involved? I said, no, I think I'm going to do a pass. 
I'm going to do a pass. I want to stick with Bitcoin. This seemed kind of superficial to me. You know, I know they were listed on coin market cap and what not for a while, but uh, it, it didn't seem like a decentralized currency to me. I didn't know what it was and what I was hearing didn't sound good. And I just said, I think I don't want to get involved. And uh, he went through a lot of trials and tribulations with that one. And you know what's interesting also? Did you know, did you go visit that site recently, CoinFire? Not recently, no. If you go to coinfire.o right now, it redirects to, what is it, 99 bitcoins because he sold to those folks. He passed on the torch. You haven't published anything to Let's Talk Bitcoin uh, for a while, right? Yeah, I haven't. I kind of see this as one way of me participating. LTB right now is speaking on the, the Bitcoin game. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I see myself doing some articles in, in the future. I have, I have a couple in mind. Um, specific some anniversary dates coming up uh, later next year or something to talk about. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Well, let me ask you this. These other outlets you write for, how much LTB coin do they pay? <laughs> oh, yes, they don't. They don't. So, yes, I need to need to get that LTB coin. That is true. They, that pay, is true. they pay in a different type of token? What, how do they pay? Well, let's see. In Cointelegraph, they pay in BTC. And um, I'm still trying to learn the process there. I am still relatively new um, there, although I did churn out a few articles. It is based on your social media interactions, which is kind of cool. So it kind of almost feels like you can get royalties, like residuals, that if people are looking at your articles in the future, that you can get a little Bitcoin for that, and they pay out once a week. How much can you game that by telling all your friends to retweet your <laughs> stuff? I do wonder. I do wonder. I just did... One article so far this year for Bitcoin Magazine after it, you know, it, it changed ownership um, around, what is it, January of this year. And so I'm just, I'm being onboarded right now with the payout process with that. They use BitWage or something like that. So we'll see how it goes. Part of the irony of, of me, like, loving Bitcoin and the supposed frictionless Bitcoin that's out there, that if you are a writer and you do everything right, like, especially like a Bitcoin Magazine, you got to fill out you know, what is it, W9 form and 10, and you're emailing everybody your social security number and such. And it's like, holy cow, I thought, you know, Bitcoin's supposed to be frictionless, but if <laughs> I want to get paid my Bitcoin, I'm giving over my social security number to everybody, and who knows where, you know, it traverses. So you write articles about things, but I have no idea if you have, like, opinions or thoughts about, let's say, something that's like, like the blockchain alliance. I guess superficially. I mean, I just think it's interesting but the, some of the things that Andreas and Antonopoulos had said and, and Bruce Fenton, and they're just, you know, hesitant to interface with government and, you know, it comes back to like what happened to Charlie Schrem because it said that like he had reached out to government to try and work with them and then they handcuffed the guy and put him in the slammer. So it's this same kind of thing that's going to happen. I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't really have, let's say, strong opinions on it. Um, just try to be more neutral on a lot of the articles that I write. I mean, that said, that I guess it's it's a little awkward actually being um, a writer about Bitcoin because if you write about Bitcoin, chances are you get paid in Bitcoin. So, like, that's like somebody who writes about stocks that they can't hold the stocks that they write about. I've kind of taken the opinion that. Listen, if I'm writing about Bitcoin, I don't really have to mention that. I think I have mentioned a website. If not, I, I probably should. Um, I'll be putting it up there shortly if I don't already. There's a lot of ways to look at it, though. I mean, you're getting paid in what could be seen as a currency. You could yes. be cashing out of it right away. That is part of Bitcoin, though, that everybody involved is a stakeholder. And that's, I think, part of the success of Bitcoin. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that said, I think it was it, 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 Timothy B. Lee. Um, he's, he's a writer and, uh, that he said, Hey, you know, I'm gonna start holding Bitcoin now. And then there was, you know, repercussions for that, that they kind of, his, his folks that wrote for said, you know what, we can't go through with this. And so he had, a, I don't know if he had a sales holdings or if he had them. I knew there's something about that. And I, and I know it was, I think one of these uh, wall street journal guys. And, you know, I was trying to be cute at the time. And I had, uh, I think I was a logged on to change tip and I, I, I tipped them like, you know, whatever, a Satoshi. It's like, was that you? You know, it's the same regards. Like these guys that like something like you're writing for the journal, you, you can't be holding Bitcoin and then probably writing about it at the same time. What's um, interesting though is, I mean, to me, like a lot of learning about Bitcoin is just trying to be hands-on with it. Yes, yes. 
to be honest, I don't think that I'm that good of a writer. Um, I'm not a good writer, to be honest. Um, I'm a good researcher and I have very good, interesting topics to write about and I find really good stories. I break the news. But I would like to be able to be more creative and I just feel this energy and I hope that I can get, um, be a better writer and not just a researcher. I hope everyone will keep their eyes open as I do, um, or I try to. When you read an article, look who wrote it and you'll see Brian's name sometimes. Where should people go if they want to get more information about what you're doing. The best place is probably my website, which is bitsofthis.com. B-I-T-O-F-T-H-I-S as in Sam.com. Great, Brian. Well, it was good to finally talk to you in person. Be well, Rob. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to episode 29 of The Bitcoin Game. I really do apologize to Brian for several things that I feel were not up to snuff. But it was great to finally talk to Brian, and I do like having guests on sometimes who haven't been interviewed before and who aren't really pitching a product. Brian has shown that you can make a mark in Bitcoin without even knowing much about it when you get involved. Please let me know what you thought of this episode by commenting in the show notes or sending me a message on Twitter at the BTC Game. You'll find all episodes of The Bitcoin Game at thebitcoingame.com. See you next time.